you're about to hear a story this morning that is one of the most amazing stories I've ever heard. When I heard it, and I only heard it in a very brief fashion over in Faith Hall, and I'm standing back in the back of the room, and I've never met the guy, and I'm like, you know, I, I need to get to know this guy. God's changed his life. God has owned this man. And so I began to get to know Bob and Teresa Williamson. They have become friends of mine and Rachel's. We've been in their home. They have been so gracious to us. Bob basically was a meth addict on the streets of New Orleans. Homeless, turned to voodoo, became a warlock, tried everything. And then one day, read the scripture. And in Atlanta, Georgia, on Lucky Street, everything changed and he became a follower of Christ and God poured out his blessing on this man he went from homelessness to starting and selling 13 companies the last one he sold for 75 million dollars the man has been blessed but this is what he'll tell you it's not in the riches it's not in the rags it's in knowing Jesus that changes your life and he will come in a moment. I was going to have him stand and let you welcome him, but he is covered up back in the back signing books. Now, let me just go ahead and say this. Children, parents, we have provision for your children today. Bob's story is very intense, at times graphic, because of the journey he's, he's been on. And so we want to be very careful and honor you as a parent in, in how you parent your children so here's what we're going to do in just a moment I'm going to pray and if you would like for your children to be taken care of we've got a great thing going on right now during our time and that way whenever Bob shares I told him I didn't want him to be hindered I want him to tell the truth and I want him to make sure that he tells us what Jesus did in his life and so I think it'd be appropriate if you'd like to choose that. You just, during the prayer, get up. I think we've got folks in the back that'll receive you, and they'll make sure you get, uh, your children get to the right place. So just keep that in mind, because it's a powerful story. Wonderful, godly man, his wife, Teresa, wonderful people. They're our guests today. I got a feeling Teresa may be in the room right now, and I think Bob could probably hear you. Would you give them a great First Orlando welcome today? Bob now resides outside of Tallahassee in Greenville, Florida. He owns a place called Honey Lake Resort. It has been his desire to buy this property and develop it so that there could be ministry that happens. And he has started a worldwide ministry out of that place. He speaks in prisons. He's on the board of Bill Glass uh, Prison Ministry. He was in Atlanta this weekend, spoke seven times, shared his testimony seven times times he'll tell you how many came to Christ it was unbelievable he's been on death row in fact he asked to go to talk to those men on death row because Bob is a living testimony of the grace of God so if there's anyone in this room this morning that thinks I'm beyond hope you picked a great day to come if you know anyone that you think is beyond hope you picked a great day to come hear a story and by the way his story would be very different had a church reached out to him when he was a young man but all he felt was judgment and condemnation and Bob told me one day the most amazing thing happened he said when he was a drug addict churches didn't want him now that he's a millionaire they love having him come and Bob says you know isn't that a shame shame on the church for looking at people that way I would agree wouldn't you absolutely well we're not gonna look that way because we see people and we value people and people matter so what I want us to do right now is we pray parents you can take this opportunity to slip to the back let's pray that God will open our eyes to see people as he sees them and to never give up hope and to know there are other Bob Williamson's out there that God has purposed incredible things but no one has reached out to care for him. No one has shared the gospel. So we're going to pray right now. Father, I pray that Bob being here today, sharing his story, will absolutely ignite a fire in us to believe that you can do all things, that no one is outside of the hope of the gospel, no one is outside of the power of the gospel. 
And I pray that you would put a love in us for people because we do believe there are others just like Bob that need to feel the love of Christ and the love of the body called the church. So Lord, thank you for our day, for our guest. It's yours. Be glorified in it. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, let's stand on our feet. Let's worship.
Is, uh, I'd like to see a show of hands. Has anybody in here lost hope? No? Maybe one or two? Great job, Pastor. 82% of the people in the world have lost hope in something, according to surveys. When you think about it, people have lost hope on their marriage, their children, a sibling, their parents, a friend at work, finding a job, those guys in Washington, D.C. It's easy to lose hope in the world. There was a time when I had lost all hope, and I wanted to commit suicide. My grandfather committed suicide, two of my uncles, and my only sibling, my brother Jim. He, uh, <clears throat> he had lost all hope. I had lost all hope. My childhood was much different than most of the people in this auditorium. It was very dark. My father was uh, very abusive, and he didn't like me. And, uh, and he took it out on me. So it's kind of like if you chain up a dog and you beat him and you scream at him every day, you'll do one or two things. You'll either break him or you'll create a monster. I became a monster. And uh, they first noticed something was wrong with me at five years old. They heard a commotion out back and went out there and I just nailed my pet rabbit by his neck to his shed and was standing out there laughing watching him die. I fought all the time, as long as I can remember. I was in and out of jail, in and out of trouble. I uh, started drinking at 12. I was an alcoholic by about 14. I started using drugs at 17. I was married and divorced with a child at 19. So I went into the military, see if it would straighten me up. When I started fighting, I started with fists. Then I put on brass knuckles. Then I used a baseball bat. Then I used a 357 Magnum, and finally a sawed-off shotgun. That was my progression. I went into the service. It did not straighten me out. In six months, I ended up in prison in Buffalo, New York, awaiting trial, court-martial. And part of my legal proceedings, they called me over to the hospital, and they had five psychiatrists in a semicircle, me sitting in the center. They interviewed me for several hours. Next day, the head psychiatrist called me over, and um, he asked me if I knew what a sociopath was. I said, no, I don't think so. He said, it means you don't have a conscience, and you're incapable of love. And if I had to guess, I'd say you're well on your way to becoming a serial killer. And I said, well, what do I do about it? He said, there's nothing you can do. If we could have got you out of your situation when you were a child, maybe. He said, it's too late. It's incurable. He said, well, I'm recommending that we discharge you from the service. So they did. So when I got out, I became an intravenous drug user. I became a meth addict. That's the most dangerous drug addict there is. I used heroin to come down after I'd been up several days. And I was very violent. I committed all kinds of crimes, armed robbery, very violent, violent crimes and I became a dealer. I became known on the street as somebody, if you mess with him, he'd kill you. Stone cold. So I ended up in parish prison. They didn't actually catch me doing anything. They wanted me off the street, so they trumped up a charge. It didn't hold up. So I got out of prison on a technicality. When I got out, I hadn't learned anything in prison except how to be a better criminal. I uh, became more violent. I used more drugs. I OD'd twice. 
I took too much meth. My liver quit functioning. I very nearly died. And uh, <clears throat> I didn't learn anything from that. I just started back as soon as I got over that and out of the hospital. Then I found out the police were really looking for me. Apparently, my reputation had gotten to somebody, and they wanted me off the street this time. And uh, so, somebody tipped me off. So I hitchhiked out of town, and I, I went up to Atlanta, Georgia. I was up there just this weekend with a prison ministry. I ended up on a street called Lucky Street. I sold a pint of blood for $7 and got a job with the winos cleaning bricks with a hatchet for $15 a day. When I got enough money, I went out to a bar and I got drunk and I beat a man half to death. I broke a beer bottle over his head, stabbed him in the face with it till it broke in my hand, stomped on his head till he wasn't wiggling. Then I got in a car and I went out and I had a head-on collision. Very nearly died. I broke my right femur. My leg was back behind me. I broke the steering wheel off with my chest. My head went through the windshield. I knocked the door on the left off with my shoulder. I had seven blood transfusions, many different operations. I was in a coma in very critical condition for a long time. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, when I came to, I had survived, obviously. I thought I had died and gone to hell. Actually, uh, it was quite frightening. But I didn't really think too much about it. I've been an insomniac all my life. That means I don't sleep. I only sleep two or three hours a night, sometimes four. Last night I slept two. So to make up for all that time spent, I would read books. I've read thousands of books. And I befriended a nurse in the hospital, Grady Memorial Hospital, charity hospital in Atlanta. And uh, she would bring me books. The librarian started sending me a list of all the best-selling books in, in, uh, in, the, in the world. You know what the best-selling book in the world is? It's the Bible. Well, I wasn't a Christian. And I didn't like Christians. Everybody had looked down on me all my life. My parents told me I was stupid. My teachers did. The police, the military. I had gone to 19 different schools in 19 different states. I didn't have any coaches or any mentors or anybody. I was by myself all my life. Nobody had ever told me they loved me. My only experience with Christian people was people looking down on me, crossing the street to get away from me. Sometimes I'd cross the street and stand in front of them. I went down to New Orleans, and I was at a park. It's called Jackson Square. And a lot of street people hang out there. And there was a preacher down there. He was standing on a crepe preaching. And I walked by, I had long hair, I had on a hat, had hair down below my shoulders, some dark glasses. I was minding my own business. I wasn't bothering anybody, just walking along. And when I walked by that guy, he angrily looked at me and he said, if you don't change your ways, you're going to hell. And I looked at him and I walked over there and I knocked him off that box and I pulled out a 357 Magnum and I said, if you ever say that to me again, I'll kill you. And I very nearly did. That man is lucky to be alive today, if he's still alive. You know, if he would have said, hey, you look like you got something on your mind. What you say we get a cup of coffee here? Let me buy you some red beans and rice and let's talk about it. Or can I pray with you? Well, he didn't do that. He just condemned me and judged me from my appearance. So that's what I thought of Christians. So I decided to read the book, the Bible, to disprove it. Now, I wasn't an atheist, and I wasn't an agnostic. I knew something was going on because I had practiced witchcraft in New Orleans, black magic, Satanists, and I'd seen it work many times. 
So I knew something was going on in another world. But I thought if there was a God, he was mean. And everything bad that had happened to me in my life, I blamed on him, not on me. So I started reading the Bible. I started in the Old Testament. It was too boring. I almost abandoned the project. But the nurse had given me her personal Bible. Her name was Lydia, and she had underlined all kinds of verses in the New Testament. So I started reading the New Testament. Well, it was nothing like I thought it was. Jesus Christ was love. He loved everybody. He was compassionate. He was kind. He would go eat with somebody that didn't meet the high standards of the society. All the religious people, the Pharisees, why are you going to eat with all those sinners and drink? And I really liked that. I really liked him because nobody had ever told me they loved me. And here he was all about love. Then I came to a book, Philippians 4.13, that said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Well, that infuriated me. I slammed that Bible shut and I threw it on the floor and I rang for my nurse and I said, get it out of here. It's nothing but a lie. She said, what are you talking about? I said, it says right here, I can do anything through Christ who strengthens me. I'm a meth addict. I've worn out the veins in both my arms. I'm shooting up in my legs. I've done horrible things to people. I've never done anything good in my life. I've been an alcoholic since I was a little kid. The only way I'll change is to be buried in a pine box in a pauper's grave like so many people I've seen. And she was a great big African-American lady and she stood there and put her hands on her hips and looked at me. She said, Jesus is God. He can do anything he wants. He made the blind see. He cured the leper. He walked on water, he fed 5,000 people, and he raised Lazarus from the dead. And if he can do all that, he can change your sorry tale. <laughs> she used a little more colorful language than that. Well, I laid back down and I thought about it and I said, well, God created everything, all the world. He could change me, but why would he want to? I'm a dope fiend. I'm a criminal. I'm scum. And then I remembered him being crucified where he was beaten beyond recognition. I couldn't even recognize him. He was so bloody. He had been whipped. 39 times on his back. He had been forced to carry a cross all the way across town. And then they nailed him up to it, took him all his clothes off in front of his mother and all his people, and laid him out there where his bones pulled apart. And you know what he said to those people that were spitting in his face and cussing him and making fun of him? He said, Father, forgive him for they know not what they do. Had that been me, I'd have said, kill them all, <laughs> slowly. Kill their kids first and make them watch. But I didn't think like God, and I couldn't think. I didn't understand grace. I didn't understand love. But I thought about the two guys being crucified with him. One of them was making fun of him and taunting him, saying, look, if you're God, Get yourself down, and while you're at it, get us down. The other one said, shut up and leave him alone. He hasn't done anything. He's a good man. He's innocent. He's good. We're criminals. We deserve to be executed. And then he looked at Jesus, and he said, Father, remember me when you enter your kingdom. Jesus said to him, this day, you'll be in paradise with me. This day, you'll be in paradise with me. And you know what that told me? Here's this criminal, vicious criminal, probably pulled the trigger quite a few times to be executed. 
It wasn't about what he had done. It's what, what Jesus had done on the cross. Those sins, you can't be good enough to get into heaven. It took Christ to come and pay our punishment and die. Well, I wanted some of that. So I asked God to come into my life. And he changed me. Where before, I could have shot you right between the eyes and never thought twice about it. I could have been eating an apple. Not anymore. Those military shrinks were wrong. It's not incurable. You should never give up hope on anybody or yourself. <laughs> Jesus Christ is Lord. He can do anything he wants, including changing anybody in this auditorium or anybody you know. He can do it. When I got out of the hospital, I got off drugs. I didn't go to rehab, I didn't go to AA, I didn't go to NA. I read my Bible. I've read it hundreds of times, every translation. I met a girl that was nothing like me. I've been married to her 43 years. I've got three sons. They're all graduated from college. I never did graduate from college. I've got seven grandkids who love me. I didn't ever have a friend in my life until I was 30 years old. Now I got them all over the world. I got a job. It was the worst job in my paint plant. My wife made more money than me. It was embarrassing and humiliating, really. But I got promoted eight times all the way into plant management. Why? Because I was the first one there, the last one to leave, and I had a great attitude. I decided I'd start my own business. Everybody said, you can't start a business. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So I borrowed $1,000 on my credit card, started a business. Six months later, it was a multi-million dollar business. I started 13 more companies. They all were multi-million dollar businesses. The last one I sold for $75 million. So I slept on the side of the road in a freezing cold, I've eaten in missions. I've hopped freights and hitchhiked all over the United States and Canada. And I've flown on private jets. And I've had all the money that anybody could want. And all I can tell you is, money's not what it's cracked up to be. Everybody in here say, well, I'd like to try it anyway. <laughs> no, you wouldn't. Whitney Houston had it all. She was beautiful. She could sing. She had Grammys. She had Academy Awards. She had fans. She had millions of records. They found her in a bathtub, drowned, full of coke, alone. One of my friends used to live next door to her. Her and Bobby Brown were out there. They were calling the police on them every other night out there fighting. She was miserable. She was raised in a choir, singing in a choir. But look where she ended up. Money, money, money. When you're 79.9 years, average person, that's all they live. Then what? God didn't create us to die. He created us to live forever. You're either going to spend that time in heaven or you're going to spend that time in hell. If you knew today you were going to die at 5 o'clock, what would you go home and pack? What are you going to take with you? This whole world chases money and prestige. Dictionary defines success, attainment of wealth, power, fame, some great achievement. Baloney. You take nothing of that, nothing with you, except what you've done in your life, the good and the bad. If you're an empire builder, build your empire in heaven. Where rust, there is none. There's no moss. There's nothing that can ever take it away from you. When you die and you face God, you're going to be alone. And you either have the blood of Christ covering your sins or you don't. If you don't, you're going to hell. You don't believe that? Read your Bible. You think, how can a good God send all those people? Have you ever read about the flood? One family, one righteous family. 
You can't be good enough to get into heaven. If you could, Christ wouldn't have had to come do what he did. Everybody has sinned. I went into a prison this weekend, and we actually went into eight of them. We had 2,333 decisions for Christ. Thank you, Lord. 1,000 first-time decisions. I, I spoke seven times. I gave my testimony like I'm given here. Every pod I went into, we went into a yard. Every man there came forward. Every man and every woman. We went into one women's unit. Those people knew they had sinned. It's much harder in a church because people don't think they've sinned. I've got to convince you that you're a sinner. No, I don't. God's Word will convict you, because I'm going to read something to you, the same thing I read to those prisoners. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23. That means every person in this auditorium is a sinner. You have sinned and you have fallen short. Now, what do you get for those sins? For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Right? Isn't that wonderful? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. I live up on a hill overlooking a lake. Every morning mist comes up. By 10 o'clock, it's gone. That's how our life is. It's here, and it's gone. But eternity is forever. Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That means you cannot be good enough to get into heaven. You have to have the blood of Christ. The only way you can get into heaven is through me. That's what Jesus said, not me. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Just like that guy on the cross. He says, we're criminals. We deserve what we're getting. I'm a criminal. I, I deserve to be in hell. But for the grace of God, I'd be dead on death row or in an insane asylum. But God spared me. Why? I don't know. I wouldn't have done it. But he did. And he spared you. He loves you. He loves you. That's what a lot of Christian people don't understand. The compassion of God. He's about mercy. He doesn't want to condemn anybody. He doesn't want to judge anybody. He said that. He said, I didn't come to condemn. I didn't come to judge. I came to save the world. Now, make no mistake about it. He will judge. But we're living in a period of grace. I don't know how long it'll last. But you need to take advantage of it while you can because we're getting near the end, in my opinion. And he says, here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come in. It's just like the two people on the cross. We have a free will. He didn't want robots. You have to choose. He's not going to force you. You can reject him or you can confess your sins and ask him to save you. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Romans 10, 9. Imagine that. God will save you. Somebody like me, a sinner. Somebody like you, a sinner. You have sinned. And the wages of that sin is death. But don't give up hope because we have Jesus Christ. Could you please bow your heads? Every eye closed, please. Father God in heaven, 
Thank you for your son, Jesus. I'm a sinner. I cannot save myself. I need a savior. Jesus, I believe you died in my sins. I believe you rose from the grave. Please forgive me of my sins. I turn to you, Jesus. Come into my heart. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and make me the person you want me to be. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Now look right up here. If you pray that prayer with me, you're going to live with Jesus Christ in heaven forever. This little 79 years here, you'll get through it. But you're going to live forever where there'll be no tears. And there's going to be no sadness and no sorrow. Just constant joy. I wanted some of that. I was miserable. When I'd walk outside, I was afraid somebody was going to shoot me or I was going to get some bad dope or the police were going to pick me up. I don't think about that anymore. I don't wait for them to kick my door down and I've got to shoot it out and go down a hail of bullets like Bonnie and Clyde. My wife comes in, one of my grandkids. I'm at peace. I know joy and love. It only comes from Jesus Christ. That's what I didn't understand. I talked to a prisoner. He said, oh, it's too hard. I've got to give up all this stuff, all the women, all the drugs. I said, it's too hard to be in prison? No, it's hard not to be a Christian, to know peace and joy in your life. And you can have it. It's free. God loves you. He wants to take away that sorrow. I told those guys, try it for 90 days. If you don't like it, he'll refund your misery. I'm going to ask Pastor David to come up and lead you in what we call invitation. I mean, God called everybody publicly. I don't like standing up here talking about all the bad things I did in life. It's humiliating. I had dinner with the governor the other day. He came over to my house. Can you imagine that, somebody like me? And I sat there and I witnessed to him just like I'm witnessing to you. I consider it an honor and a privilege to think about what Jesus Christ did for me. And the least I can do is stand up for him. I'm happy to do it. I hope you are too. This is nothing to walk down here and publicly profess, Lord, I confess my sins. I'm going to turn from that life, and I'm going to stick with you from now on. This is a great church, and you can find your church home right here today. And you should. And you just remember one thing. No matter what anybody says about you, Jesus Christ loves you. He loves you so much we can't even comprehend it. The Bible tells us that. More than we can imagine. And we ought to emulate him. And if you see somebody that's down and out, help them out. Ask them if you can pray with them. Don't put another nail in their religious coffin. Don't be some hypocrite. Think about Anthony Weiner. Everybody heard of him? I saw a news clip of him the other day, and everybody was screaming at him, you're a pervert, you're a scumbag. You know what he said? Who are you to judge me? He's right. I don't condone his sin. I hate sin. But we're to love the sinner. 
I didn't hear anybody screaming out, Anthony, I'm praying for you. But that's what we need to do as Christians. And once you accept Christ for your Savior, that's the very next thing. All four Gospels. The last thing Jesus did before he ascended into heaven was say, go and be a witness for me throughout the land. No matter how humiliating your story is or how uncomfortable it may be in this politically correct world. Go out and stand up for Jesus Christ. Okay? Two things as we worship. If anyone in this room prayed that prayer, the Bible says that he heard, and those who call upon the name of the Lord, they will be saved. God heard you. We want to celebrate with you and pray for you and encourage you. Number two, do you know somebody that you've given up on? Or you think they're beyond hope? What about if you were to come this morning to this altar and pray for them? After hearing this, what if you were to stand and say, God, I know you can do it. I've heard a man that you changed his life. And call your friend's name. Maybe it's a family member, somebody you work with, somebody you go to school with, and you think they're beyond hope. No, they're not. Pray for them. So as we worship, as God speaks to you, whatever it is, there are going to be some pastors. Guys, go ahead and come and stand as we worship together. What is it God's saying? What does he want you to do? Do it right now. God bless you, sir. Let's worship.
Hey, while we're still praying with folks down here, you listen to Bob, and it just makes you believe God can do anything. And it makes you stand and say, I'm not ashamed. Because I know a God who can change lives. Bob was in town about a month ago. He was invited to speak to the counselors and the Department of Health for Florida brought him in to speak to those who deal with drug dependencies and are part of counseling centers and so forth. And they wanted him to come and tell the story of how he got off his dependency to drugs and alcohol. And I got a text from him right before he was to speak. And he said, you need to pray for me because I'm about to stand and look at a bunch of counselors, 900 of them, and tell them there's one name. His name is Jesus. He delivered me from everything. And I get a text a couple hours later. I told them. And they didn't kill me, so I'm okay. Let me tell you, never be ashamed of the name. What you heard this morning happens one way, Jesus Christ. That's it. In the book, Insanity of God, a persecuted believer in Russia made this statement to those of us in America. Hey, don't you give up in your freedom what we were not willing to give up in our persecution. In other words, don't you give up the name. Don't give up faith. Don't give up the gospel in your freedom because we weren't willing to give it up in our persecution. In other words, we are free to stand. We are free to declare his name. So one more time, I want you to sing it loud. Oh, praise the one. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt. Let's sing it out to him right now. Declare it. Don't be ashamed. stay if you want to come please the freedom and in, in, in this room counselors pastors will be there and you can text us the word ready to 292929 because we realize that this morning with a story like that God is moving and speaking to so many of us I, I don't know what you heard but I can tell you that the full story is in this book a lot of things Bob did not share now I need to warn you and you need to hear me. I don't want the emails. I need to warn you. This is very graphic. But Bob intentionally wrote the truth because he wanted people to know our God is stronger than the worst you can do. And he did it and he tells you. This book is available back in the back. This money doesn't go to Bob. He leaned over and he said, man, your people are gracious. Let them know every bit of this goes into ministry. His place, Honey Lake, he wants to open up a worldwide ministry center there. And so I want to encourage you, consider getting this book for somebody that's given up or somebody that you think they would need it to know that they're not beyond hope. Or maybe you just get it and just, I gave it to a guy a couple of weeks ago. I said, hey, I know you don't think God can change your life. Read this book. Get back to me. Because this is Bob's story, the full story. Now let me just say this. I, I don't know what you heard, but I tell you what I heard in his story. You never know when you meet somebody on the side of the road 
who they may become one day. You never know when you meet someone who's down and out, who's really hit hard times, you never know what God may do. And what if we got in their way? What if we were the ones that stood in the way between them and an eternity in hell? What if we interrupted their misery with the love of Jesus Christ? Can you imagine what would have happened early on if God, through his people, had reached out to Bob? If the people had loved him? Well, the good news is, Bob found Christ. And now he's doing the same all over. I, you know who I want to meet in the story? You, his wife is incredible. What an incredible woman. You know who I want to meet? Lydia. Lydia. How many of you want to meet Lydia? So, get this. A nurse, just doing her job, challenged him and shared the gospel next week. I'm going to preach on serving at work. How to use your work as a mission field. How to see it as a mission field and to use it as ministry without violating, without violating any company code. I hear this all the time. Pastor, where I work, there's no Christians. Where I work is just a bunch of pagans. And this is what I want you to hear me say. Wow, how awesome is that? that God would put you there as a missionary and consider you worthy to be the only one. He must think you're awesome so that he would place you there for the glory of the gospel. I just think we could reach Central Florida, but it won't be in the church houses. It'll be everywhere we work. Now, they'll end up in the church, but it'll start in the break room. It'll start everywhere we go to work with the gospel, the salt and light. So I pray you'll come back next week. And by the way, if you could keep us in prayer, my wife and I will marry one of our children, the first one, this next weekend. Andrew will be getting married to Kayla. And I will do my best to preside at that wedding. So I could appreciate the prayers. And hopefully next weekend we'll have a lot of family here to introduce to you. And we bragged on you and told them about you. And it'll be kind of cool for them to get to be here and experience. Just like Bob leaned over to me and said, this is an amazing place. You really are. And as we go, you remember the verse that turned everything around for him? Philippians 4.13. Let's say it twice, okay? Because it'll take the first time to get the rhythm. And then we'll say it again, okay? Twice. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. One more time. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now go do it. Have a wonderful Lord's Day. God bless you.